Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N. Healthy world, healthy nation, healthy you. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse. And this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And we are having a show today that is the next installment in a series entitled Tales of a Family Caregiver. And we have our returning guest, Dr. Gloria Donnelly, who I will reintroduce in a moment. Our show today in Tales of a Family Caregiver is going to focus on the following show topic. We are entitling our show today, On Call, Choosing and Partnering with a Primary Care Provider tailor-made to navigate anticipated health problems and challenges with caregiving at home. Now, many of you that are watching this show today are caregivers at home, or you may know caregivers at home. And we hope that this show will help you to understand better the challenges and to give you actual tips to make your job easier. Let me introduce Dr. Gloria Donnelly, who is with us today. Our guest today is Dean and Professor of the College of Nursing and Health Professions at Drexel University here in Philadelphia. Welcome, Gloria. Thank it's, you. it's great to have you back again. Let me, let me tell you something about this dynamic woman. She has <coughs> a native Philadelphian, has many degrees that have really put her in a great place to be a great Dean and Professor of Nursing. She has also published four textbooks and is the editor of Holistic health nursing today. She has done many things and volunteered in the Philadelphia area and is really very respected among all of us, her peers. So Gloria, let's talk about our show today because I think what you're going to do is really help us with how to make that choice of a primary care provider, whether that's a physician mm -hmm. or a nurse practitioner, you're going to help us with some of the nuts and bolts that yes. you had to face as a caregiver. And the most important thing to know about uh, Dr. Donnelly's background is that she has feet on the ground, hands-on experience with her own family members, as she is really going to tell us about her family members that she took care of at home. And that's really how she got her training right. in this field. Right. Well, you know, I, we, my husband and I took care of my mother-in-law, my father, and my mother for a total of 22 years. That's a long time. A very long time. And, and I really uh, deeply, deeply appreciate the importance of having a primary care provider. And in our case, we had a physician who was really tuned in to the issues of family caregiving, not only from the perspective of the health problems that would arise with our parents, but the health problems that could be potentially problematic for my husband and I, who were the caregivers. That's right. So I think what we're hearing already is that you need a person that is really very family oriented. Yes. Not just the individuals. Um, how about other background uh, credentials? Are there certain uh, primary care physicians well, or nurses that yes. have special training? I, I can tell you with when my mother was having difficulties. Now this was very early on. Uh, when my mother and father first moved in, when my mother was having difficulties, one night I came home, this was before we found our magical primary care provider. My father was in the living room and my mother was sitting in a chair all slumped over. And I said to my dad, who was good then, how long has mom been this way? Now my mother had dementia at the time. Oh, he said she just fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think so. And I tried to arouse her, and she was really dead weight. And her face looked like she may have had a stroke. Right. So I reached out to a physician, a geriatrician in the system that might be able to help me. And I really can't emphasize enough how important it is for a family caregiver to feel free to make that phone call, not to hold back, not to think you're bothering somebody. And I called uh, Joel and I, and I told him what was happening and he said, Gloria, don't worry. 
uh, I have nurse practitioners that go into the home. Now, this was 15 years ago. Right, so that was really ahead that of the curve. That was very, very ahead of the curve. I have nurse practitioners that go into the home. Tomorrow morning, I will send one of my nurse practitioners to your home to check out your mother. And when she came, she looked, she did the assessment, and my mother was transferred to the hospital. Well, that was a good yes. outcome. So, a, a very good outcome. She was very wonderful. She was herself a very, very competent family nurse practitioner that had all this geriatric mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a team that later on, uh, and the internist that we selected for my father and my mother-in-law was my husband and my own internist who knew us very well and who agreed to uh, include my father and mother-in-law in the whole, I called it the care package because we were a family that was treated entirely by this one primary care provider. Right, so this was a one-size-fits-all kind exactly. of person. But I, let's go back, though, because it sounds like you did have someone before, as you referred to, this yes, magical for my mother, person. Yes, for my mother. Uh, uh, so, Joel, uh, it, actually, Joel Posner was the physician who had this very large practice, who uh, uh, was a geriatrician. Uh, I worked with him in uh, the institution where I was employed at the time, and he had uh, many, many nurse practitioners mm -hmm. in his practice. Mm -hmm. And he was doing primary care in the home, I think, before it became fashionable with the Affordable Care Act. That, that's really great. Now, tell everyone what a geriatrician is, because not okay, everyone's going to know a that A geriatrician term. is a physician who is board certified in the care of the elderly. So that's a special it's track It's a special of track education. of, of I, I think it's a special track post medical school. You can do residencies mm -hmm. in geriatrics. And, uh, and of course, the health problems of, of uh, the elderly are, uh, they're not unique, but they are unique to the elderly. So you, you may have problems of um, uh, hypertension. Many, many elderly have hypertension. Uh, over 50% of elderly are obese, an interesting statistic. Right. Uh, problems with the heart. Many right. have heart problems, vision problems, cataracts, glaucoma, uh, problems with hearing. Uh, vision problems are sometimes compounded by dementia because there are spatial problems which then promote falls. Right. So you really need a primary care provider who understands well, and not, can anticipate. Right, right. Not only understands, but really can knit all those pieces together because yes. they're not isolated situations. Um, the heart, the vision, the hearing, it all does fit together. And I think what Gloria is telling us is that a geriatrician, which is a specialized training, really helps to you to really figure out how you can put these pieces together. Now, I want to ask you in terms of how you located this, this magical physician, although it's not so magical, there are more than, there's more than one person out there that has the skill set. How did you find this person, meaning that you worked with him, as you mentioned, right. but how would the average person be able to locate people with this kind of skill set? Well, I think the average person now has a lot easier time locating a good geriatrician than 15, 20 years ago right. when I was looking for mine. Right. Because there's so much out there on the internet. Mm -hmm. You can go to, let's say, if you live in the Philadelphia area, you could go to a local website that, um, uh, like a medical school. Mm -hmm. So we have five medical schools in, in this area. And you could go to their website and you could put in geriatrician or geriatric practice. And then a whole series of uh, physicians will come up with a little bio. My recommendation to people is read these, talk to some people who might know of their practice, but interview. Never commit 
to a primary care or any kind of provider for a health problem unless you have a sense of whether or not it's a good fit between you and the provider. Right. Now, I think that's really worth a few moments to focus in on that because the idea of interviewing a doctor, I don't think most of us really think about doing. Mm -hmm. We think if we get a good recommendation from a friend or certainly from another health professional, that's it. You know, just just get on board and, and make the appointment. Tell I, us that process. Walk us through that process. I think it's Gloria. happening more and more. Okay. And my own primary care physician has described experiences where people make an appointment to see him and they come in and say, uh, I am new to the area or my physician moved out of the area mm -hmm. and I am looking for a new primary care provider and this is what I'm looking for. Now, if, if, the primary, if the physician or the NP or whoever it is you're, you're interviewing is put off by that, then my advice is to get out of the chair and leave. Right. Because you want somebody who is respectful of your need to have information about whether or not this is a good fit. Right. Now, let's ask a couple basic questions. Sure. When you make that appointment, do you have to say, I would like to have an interview with the physician? That's one question. And the second question is, do people have to pay for this interview? Well, I, I would consider it a regular visit. You could do it one of a few ways. Okay. You could say, I'd like to come in. I'm new. I would be a new patient for whomever, the doctor, the nurse practitioner. I don't think there's any harm in, in that in that first meeting if the physician takes your blood pressure or does any kind of assessment but when that's over right and when the the little intake or history is done then you do the interview and say you know I'm really here to figure out whether or not I would be or you would be for me a good primary care provider right and then just make it part of the visit which you know may or may not be covered by your insurance however all of that works but I would do it in a combined way you really don't have to announce your interviewing but you just interview right and then figure out whether or not this person is the kind of person that you will feel comfortable with, that you could confide in. I would ask the person how available they are by phone. If I have a problem on a weekend and I call your number, who will answer? Uh, do you have an on-call service that could just help with basic problems and issues? I remember one primary care provider for my mother-in-law early on who, if we ever called on a weekend, the, the response always was, go to the ER. Right, that, and can there, be, that can be even done on a voice message. Exactly, but there were lots of times, and, and I know because I'm a nurse, going to the ER was not appropriate. That maybe all we needed was uh, a certain kind of medication or an increased dose or uh, a something that would get, get my mother-in-law through the, the difficult period until we could get her into the office right. to see the physician. But saying go to the ER on a regular basis is just not the answer you want. Right. We changed primary care providers. Well, I think that's great advice, and that's really basic advice. That's really for any physician that you are, or a nurse practitioner, practice team, whoever you are going to be linking up with as your partner. You really need to make this a partnership and have those discussions, which again, for many people is not something that we're necessarily used to, but I think that Gloria has given us the, the verbiage, you know, really how to, how to conduct that, what to ask, what to say. And you should feel comfortable doing that because you are paying for this service. And this is really something that needs to fit your needs. So let's go back to the idea of really choosing a geriatric focused group team, physician, nurse practitioner. When you have your family members involved with this, even if they're older and aging, do you suggest that they get involved with making some of uh, the assessment of this yes. match as well? Actually, if, you know, if there's not an issue of competence 
or if there's not a lot of fear and anxiety, which sometimes accompanies dementia. Mm -hmm. For example, with my mother-in-law and with my father, not so much my mother because she was pretty far down the path with dementia, but my mother-in-law and my father, I took them to the primary care provider that I thought would be good for them when uh, the, I, I observed mm -hmm. the interaction. Uh, and when we left the office, I asked my mother-in-law and my father, what did they think? Would they feel comfortable mm -hmm. seeing this physician? And they both said yes. I knew they would right. because he is particularly good with uh, the elderly and with treating families. He's got a very family-oriented uh, kind of practice. And you could see families coming in when you're, you're sitting in the waiting room. So yes, I, you, you have to include the person uh, given that they are competent and can give you an opinion. I think it's the respectful thing to do. Right, and I think uh -huh. that is really a very key point too because even as people are getting older, they are really very much wanting to be involved. They want to feel in charge to whatever degree we can have them feel in charge. Yes. And so by simply asking for their input, in this manner is really very empowering and makes your, in your case, your family members, and in for those of you who are listening, your family members to feel that they are included in this and that it's really a very positive step. You know, you know that's a very important point, Nancy, because before my mother-in-law moved in with us, she had um, my, uh, a heart attack and she landed in a hospital. And uh, this is like 20, 25 years ago. And um, the cardiologist at the time went in my mother-in-law's room, he sat at the bottom of the foot of her bed, he watched the football game, and then he told her she had to have an angioplasty. And, when, and she refused to ask him any questions, she was very shy, and when I came in she said to me, I wrote down this word, what is it? <clears throat> and I told her what it was, you know, they were going to put a catheter in her blood vessel and look at the blood vessels in her heart. It wasn't surgery and that's what the doctor I suppose thought was uh, warranted. And she said, I don't want it. And I said, okay. She said, I don't want anything like that. I'm 82 years old. I got to 82 without any help with any of these gadgets <laughs> and I don't want it. Which is her choice. Which is her choice. So I, I left and I talked with my husband and I said, you know, your mother doesn't want this procedure. He said, well, you call, you call her primary care doctor. Uh, it wasn't the primary care doctor who wanted to do this, it was the cardiologist. So I did, I called the next day and I said, you know, Helen does not want an angio. Well, I think she has to have it. I said, but you know, it's her choice. I said, let me ask you this. Can you handle her, you know, her shortness of breath or the tightness in the chest? Can you handle it symptomatically? Which tell our audience what that means. That means, can you give her a medication to take? So the symptoms are controlled without going in and doing anything invasive. Right. Well, I suppose we could try that, but you know, uh, and this was interesting. He said to me, you're a nurse, you should make her do it. And I said, no, I'm her daughter-in-law. Right. I'm a member of the family, and she's right. She did get to age 82 without a whole lot of medical intervention, so I think we need to respect that. Well, she died at age 101. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think we need to respect people's wishes because they know their bodies. Well, I think that is the, the best point of that discussion. And we have really made that point in some other shows. And that is know your own body, listen to your own body. That doesn't mean that you don't take medical advice. Obviously you do. But you also have to filter that through your own lens of what you think is the best thing for you. Exactly. And in this case, an 82-year-old woman did not know what the medical procedure really meant. She just knew that if it was invading her body, she didn't want it. She would rather try something that was really uh, more low-key. More low-key, more low-tech, 
first. Right. And so that was the agreement, and it worked. Right. And she had a nitroglycerin patch, which was this little patch we put on her chest every morning that had medication in it that went through her skin, and it kept her symptom free for 19 years. Well, that's a beautiful story. I wish we could tell more of those stories. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there are more out there than we even really give credit for, but I think it's a very, very good point. Let's go back to the, the family caregiver. We've made the point so far in this program that you really have to have the right match and you need someone with that skill set who will be on call, who will really talk to you anytime you need to talk to that person or has a staff that will be available to you. So you don't get voice messages or a direction that really doesn't fit your particular situation. So maybe you could give us a couple uh, examples of the kinds of problems that people typically encounter at home and how that caregiver with in team with the family and you in team with the actual people involved in this case mm -hmm. your three relatives at home right how does it all work together well you know I think one of the biggest problems for family caregivers and actually for those being cared for is sleep yes so if you don't have a good night's sleep particularly if you're working and you know you can't really catch up or chill out the next day it really does affect a whole lot of things right. and then down the line your health and my mother-in-law had horrible problems with sleep uh, particularly as she got into her 90s she wouldn't sleep with uh, without a very bright light on which of course kind of lit up the whole second floor uh, and uh, she she didn't sleep with that light on because we all know ourselves that we put the lights out when we go to sleep. Most people put the lights out because you have to have dark for your body to produce a certain substance called melatonin that helps you sleep. Right, I think we, we started doing that when we were in the caves. Absolutely. Right. So, so here my mother-in-law is waking up at night. She's not sleeping and actually became very agitated and she decided that if she couldn't sleep that we shouldn't sleep <laughs> and that was in her really when she was getting to her declining years and so I was and, and you have to talk about you know family caregivers often keep these issues very close to the vest they don't want to talk about them I don't know if it's a question of shame or guilt or whatever it is or you know. maybe they don't think people are interested exactly uh, but I began talking about these sleep issues and I ran into a, this biologist at work he's a specialist in circadian rhythms and he said to me Gloria I know what you could try a red light bulb a red light bulb. What did you have to do? Go get through so, your Christmas light bulbs no, and find so a red I went, one? No, I went to, uh, uh, I went to the, uh, the supermarket and there on the shelf was a red LED, you know, with the little, the, the twiny <laughs> light. And I bought two. And I put one in my uh, mother-in-law's light and one in my father's. And I said to him, so what's the theory? Well, he said when, uh, you know, we were evolving as human beings and people were sleeping in the caves, um, they needed to keep warm. So red light, they adapted, their eyes adapted to red light. Meaning and the fires? The fires, and they still were able to produce melatonin and stay warm. That's, a, that's amazing. Yes, but in the morning, yellow light, or blue light, if there was yellow light or blue light or white light, they could, they, that melatonin production went down. Okay, I was willing to try anything because quite frankly, my husband and I were desperate. I put the light bulb in and I, I don't think twice a month we had a problem. So it was like magic? It worked. It was like magic. Boy, that's a great tip. And I actually then, uh, put one in my father's room, although he did not have the kind of severe sleep problems that my mother-in-law had, but my mother-in-law slept much, much more soundly 
with a red light bulb there and if she needed to get up or call somebody she could still see right because there was the glow right. of this red light right so it, it and and you know when i told my primary care provider this he said well i'm going to pass that along because he was comfortable enough and and actually he was you know we had tried some sleeping medications none of them worked not with my family members paradoxical reactions uh, grogginess all day so medication was not an answer in our particular case right and that's another thing you have to work with your primary care provider on right I think uh, and paradoxical by the way means that if you're taking a medication to to put you to sleep it does just the opposite it right. sort of revs you up and, and it's almost uh, like an amphetamine. You know, you mm -hmm. really feel like really jazzed and the last thing you're gonna do is sleep. And some of this we don't know may be having to do with a the aging process and medications do work differently on people as they age. But I think this idea of a red light versus medication is first of all very practical, it's very doable, it will cost less money and you will get a better outcome. So I think that's mm -hmm. a, a wonderful piece of advice. The other thing I heard in that description, Gloria, is that it does take a village. Not everybody knows everything. No, that's right. So passing on these tips that's and right. learning from one another is really very valuable. Yes, it is. And you know, even when, you know, the kinds of things you have to anticipate with, uh, with your loved ones. Uh, uh, I, I made many trips to the ER, particularly around falls, and that's another whole issue that I, I think, uh, I, ho I hope you focus on in the future because that's a whole show. Right, right. that's a whole world. Yes, so uh, uh, getting to the ER, calling your primary care provider and saying, I'm on my way to the ER uh, for this, this, and this. And then the primary care provider saying, you're doing the right thing and when you get there, ask this, tell them to try that, tell them to call me from the ER. Right. Very important right. that your primary care provider is uh, interested enough and involved enough in the care of you and your loved one to say, you know, it's not just an emergency, it's my emergency too. Right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Gloria Donnelly for being with us today and really spelling out the vital importance of having a physician a nurse practitioner or a primary care team that is really in it for you. So the idea of this show even be coming, be calling rather on call, choosing that primary care physician or practice partner that's going to work with you in a partnership is really very vital. So just to, to say again, what we have covered in this show is that we've talked about all the reasons why you need a really strong partnership with that primary care provider. And we've also talked about sleep disturbance and how you need to sleep as well as the people that you're caring for need to sleep. And this idea of a red light bulb being a, a solution, I would invite you to try and let us know if it works for you. Then we've also talked about trips to the emergency room and how when you have to make that judgment, you wanna to talk to your primary care team before you go, if, unless it's a true emergency where you don't have the time to do that. And when you're there, you want to be able to feel that you have the freedom to call, get their advice, let have a discussion on the next steps, what's going to happen with discharge, what's going to happen when they come home. So that it's really a continuous story and you are not left isolated by yourself taking care for your loved ones because you must take care of yourself as well as for the others that you are taking care of. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, Gloria. Thank you. I'm really enjoying this series of Tales of a Family Caregiver. We are going to have other subsequent shows, so we hope we will join you, you will join us for those as well. So thank you again for joining us. Remember, with health, all things are possible. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.